they intentionally chose to strip away all the context. There's a, a spare in the air, a title that had been somewhat used against me for a long part of my life. There are even stories that you knew all along that this was going to happen, you went through the whole process. Can you imagine how little sense that makes? I left my career. I certainly don't see myself as a victim. I do not and have never looked for sympathy in this. I'm really grateful to be able to share my story in the hopes that it will help, empower and encourage others. Sounds great. There's only one problem though. Do these nice words actually correspond to reality, to the actions of Harry and Meghan? Let's find out. We'll look at revealing moments from Harry and, I'm sorry, Meghan and Harry's interview with Oprah, the breathtaking Netflix documentary, and key interviews and compare them to this article. One of the pillars of unreliable language is sounding grandiose and vague, the kind of language we all know from political speeches. When it comes to giving without receiving, giving without getting money and or publicity for it, it makes sense to say you're doing it for other people. However, it doesn't make sense to say you're doing it for other people when you're signing one contract after another to complain about the past, like Harry and Meghan. At that point, it's a business. It would have been very interesting to see if he would have done it without getting paid, because that's more than doubtful. So when Harry claims he's doing it to hopefully let people understand that we are in some shape and form all connected, especially through trauma, the unspecific nature of these words makes the sentence sound inauthentic and thus unreliable. This is classic frame shifting, because Meghan and Harry know how their statements will be perceived, egotistical and self-serving. They make an attempt to anticipate these objections and change the frame that they're doing it for other people. Megan used the same tactic in her interview with Oprah. She says she shares this because many people are afraid to voice that they need help. And she says this while blaming anything and everything but herself. There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. no, no, I mean, it's, it's, no, but even down, yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem. <laughs> No one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling. Did you share these existential problems for other people as well? You know, the many people who have a hard time spending 20 to 30 minutes on learning a new song. No, it sounds like what it is. A self-serving conversation that's about listing as many excuses as possible because the duo was surprised about the backlash that their actions, their own decisions, actually had consequences. Who would have guessed? This tactic is incredibly manipulative, because on a surface level, what Megan says about sharing this for the sake of other people sounds good, and anyone who dares contradict it sounds insensitive. It's virtue signaling to the nth degree. However, feelings and facts can be two very different things. That's why, oftentimes, the truth can be immensely insensitive. Because it's completely separated or can be completely separated from how a person feels about something. Sometimes the truth contradicts our feelings, sometimes it doesn't. What's important is that we always strive for truth, irrespective of feelings. And that's a journey Meghan and Harry haven't taken yet. Maybe because it's more profitable to avoid that journey. I don't know. Just a guess, I guess. First time that the, the, the penny dropped for her, Em and I spent the night in a room in Buckingham Palace after an event where every single member of the family, senior members of the family had been, including the Queen. And on the front page of the Telegraph, Meghan. I went, oh my God. She was like, but it's not my fault. And I said, I know. And my mum felt the same way. No way this scene's made specifically to create sympathy. The music, Harry's voice and the theme don't sound like a victim narrative at all. No way. Here's another clip where Harry doesn't want sympathy. Our security was being pulled. Everyone in the world knew where we were. I said, we need to get out of here. To see this institutional gaslighting. But I wasn't being thrown to the wolves. I was being fed to the wolves. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. This can't be a victim narrative, can it? I mean, it's not like the documentary specifically referred to Megan as a scapegoat. 
a word that in many cases happens to be a synonym to the word victim. Meg became this scapegoat for the palace, and so they would feed stories on her, whether they were true or not. Also, if they didn't want sympathy, why the music? Why the images that are designed to make us sympathize with the charming duo? Or better yet, what is this documentary even about if not to create sympathy? They just wanted to be free. They wanted to be free to love and be happy. But okay, since Harry doesn't want sympathy, let's try and change the music and images slightly and see what happens. It shouldn't matter, right? I've analyzed most of these scenes from the documentary, but not the first one I played. Before moving on to other things, it's important to note that this scene reveals more than meets the eye. Let's see how it establishes the protagonist-antagonist framework, contrary to the claim that Harry and, by inference, Meghan, never wanted sympathy and never wanted to be seen as victims. Background music is non-diegetic, meaning it originates from a source outside the story world. Non-diegetic music is designed to make people emote and, you guessed it, create sympathy. One of the ways music does this is by creating imagery in people's heads. Pleasant images or unpleasant images. Or it creates sensations. Pleasant sensations and unpleasant sensations. Music can feel like a massage or like nails on a chalkboard. First time that the, that the penny dropped for her. The music's dominated by minor chords, and the consistent the staccato has a stinging her. sensation and to I it, like pinpricks. The music determines what the filmmakers the want us to think about the, the images. The penny we could have seen the image with this kind of music. But we don't, and the relevant question is why we don't. Because the palace, or more likely the people in it, are supposed to be antagonists. That's why the music has to be unpleasant, or at least serious. It's a nighttime photo which complements the mood that the filmmakers are trying to establish. That there's a certain darkness to the royal life that people don't know. Maybe something hidden or dishonest. Either way, these are negative connotations, which is the point. The lights in the foreground help establish the difference between the facade and what's underneath the facade. That we might see all the beautiful lights, but not the darkness underneath, or in this case, the darkness right behind it. When Harry enters, the lighting mysteriously changes. It's all bright now, and unlike the long shot of the palace that made it appear cold and distant, we get a close-up. Close-ups not only get us physically closer to a person, but also psychologically closer, like this. Let me know if it worked. Harry is in a homey environment, with a warm light in the background. Because we don't hear any objections or even questions, what he's saying is given absolute truth value, as it's called. This is ethos appeal, giving credibility to the person that the filmmakers want us to view as reliable. Once after Harry enters, event, there are after, subtle but important event, musical after, changes. Event, the piano is starting to get more prominent. This adds an element of sadness to the images. The music can be said to be round for a few seconds, as opposed to the sharpness that characterized it a few seconds earlier. First time that after an event where the music then the resumes its sharpness as it's building up to the, the climax. The Just like movies and documentaries have climaxes, individual scenes have climaxes, and individual pieces of music in sequences like this also have climaxes. We Every hear the staccato the and the piano the building up to the Megan. letting us know that Megan was the climax all along, and also inviting us to feel as offended or shocked as Megan. I went, oh my god. These are the techniques. There are no guarantees that they work. And in this specific instance, no guarantees at all. I went, the music oh then levels out, making she the like, piano the most prominent fault. instrument. I, said, I know. She was like, but it's not my fault. And I said, I know. And my mom felt the same way. The quote unquote eerie staccato is gone, and a feeling of sadness concludes the scene, as Harry again looks for sympathy by mentioning that it wasn't Megan's fault and by appealing to his mother. 
a recurring pattern in almost all of his interviews. In conclusion then, a short sequence like this contradicts Harry's claim that he doesn't want sympathy. Also, he wrote an entire book, page after page, with small details that no one asked for. By all definitions, these are pathos appeals, appeals to emotion and pity. If a 30 second scene tells us all this, what do all the episodes of the docuseries tell us? Or interviews? They intentionally chose to strip away all the context and turn it into a salacious headline. Well, um, I mean, there which are is, problems Which is somewhat the typical. There's a, a spare in the air, a title that had been somewhat used against me for a long part of my life. His life is, is planned out for him. Yeah. Whereas for the spare, mm, that's not really what you should do. You should kind of be sitting there a little bit in the monarch shadow and just wait your turn. Harry's strategy with everything he does is to get people on his side. That's the only reason for going public with this kind of pathos. He tries tapping into feelings and values that all people have in order to get them to see things from his and Meghan's perspective. In the Oprah interview, Meghan used identical tactics. In the following, notice how she associates with Americans to get them to feel the same as her. I didn't romanticize any element of it, but I think as Americans especially, what do you know about the royals? It's what you read in fairy tales. Right. You think is what you know about the royals, right? right? So it's easy to have an image of it that is so far from, from reality. She but says you and that it's easy you know to have an royals? image that's far to... from reality. She consistently avoids the personal pronoun I when admitting that she had an image that was far from reality, which she actually admits here. Funny how she makes it sound like she romanticized it, even though she just finished claiming that she didn't romanticize it. And funny why that verb, romanticize, is on her mind in case she didn't romanticize it. I'd say that Megan comparing herself to the Little Mermaid tells us all we need to know about her unrealistic expectations, which, by the way, is synonymous with romanticizing. Or what about this claim? I will say I went into it naively. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't do any research about what that would mean. You didn't do any research? No. I've never looked up my husband online. I didn't fully understand what the job was, mm -hmm. right? What, I didn't she adds fully understand the modification the fully, was, implying right? that she did understand, understand the job, the job just was, not fully, mm -hmm. right? however she chooses to define this word. And she says, right, I didn't asking rather than stating. Was, mm -hmm. Right has an implicit preference for agreement that the other speaker, Oprah, agrees with this. Right implies shared knowledge between two speakers or more. Thus, depending on the context, it can have a manipulative function. In the same interview, Meghan said she wasn't trying to be disparaging to anyone, which is ironic considering that she went on to be disparaging, not to anyone, but to Catherine specifically. The same way Harry makes both direct and subtle attacks on William and Catherine's image, most likely because he would like to have their image or because he doesn't want to be the only one with a negative image. Oh, but image doesn't mean anything to Harry, he's past that. No, the documentary made it clear that image matters a great deal to him, kind of like the newspapers he criticizes. When someone who's marrying in, who should be a supporting, a supporting act, is then stealing the limelight or is doing the job better than the person who was born to do this, that upsets people, it shifts the balance. That's absurd, Meghan's subtle attempts to portray Catherine as the antagonist and portray herself as the protagonist, victim, who got her feelings hurt. Let's keep in mind that Meghan not only knew all the questions in advance, but that she also helped choose the questions. Did you make Kate cry? No. So where did that come from? Was there a situation where she might have cried or she could no, have cried? No, no, the no. reverse happened. And I don't say that to be disparaging to anyone because she did what I would do if I knew that I hurt someone, right? To just take accountability for it. A few days before the wedding, she was upset about something. It made me cry and it really hurt my feelings. In the new interview, Harry said, I know how important it is to share these stories how you can save a life and improve lives because you're almost giving people permission to talk about their own stuff and be themselves. I wonder, does that include being disparaging to Catherine, comparing yourself to a cartoon character, and complaining about doing a Google search? What he says looks good on paper, 
but as we've observed, it doesn't correspond to reality at all. There are two moments in particular that show us what happens when an interviewer finally dares hold them accountable or express skepticism. The following is Harry's disingenuous reaction to an accountability question. Recently, you lost your grandmother. Did she ever express that she was upset at you? For what? Harry knows for what, but pretends not to know. And with the question, he implicitly makes the claim that he has nothing to be ashamed of. Megan's way of reacting to skepticism is more extreme. There's a point in the interview where Oprah finally confronts Megan with people's negative views. Of course, she doesn't really confront her because it's all pre-planned. However, Megan's reaction tells us more than she wants us to know. There are even stories that you knew all along that this was going to happen, you went through the whole process, and it was all intentional to build your brand. Can you imagine? how little sense that makes. I left my career, my life, I left everything because I love him, right? First of all, she doesn't respond with a clear denial. Instead, she answers with a question. Can you imagine? And adds the word, right? At the end, asking rather than stating. Also, the life she left behind can't be compared to the fame and fortune she would get by being part of a royal family. So she didn't make a sacrifice at all, even though that's what she makes it sound like. On the contrary, she stood to gain wealth and worldwide attention. What about this new role? I mean, you're going to have an, a bigger platform, a bigger voice. What do you want to do with it? As you said, the causes that have been very important to me, I can focus even more energy on. The skepticism Oprah finally presents to her here obviously upsets her. In the following, she makes pauses and restarts, indicating internal stress. And our plan was to do this forever. For us, yeah, for us, for our us, plan for, us. for me, I mean, I wrote letters to his family when I got there saying, I am dedicated to this. I'm here for you. Use me as you'd like. There was no guidance as well, right? Again, Megan's busy explaining how much she did allegedly. However, just because she wrote letters, it doesn't mean she was actually dedicated. I'm not supposed to say this, but I trust you not to say this to anyone else. When I was in high school and had to do exam papers about topics I didn't find interesting, I sometimes wrote that I found the topics interesting, because I had to. The point is, letters consist of words, and in many cases, words are very different from actions. The last part of this passage is the most interesting. This is where we see Megan's go-to response, to blame anything and everything, even when only mildly confronted. Not exactly the typical behavior of someone we're supposed to find relatable. Also, Megan's claims are all pathos appeals. Failed appeals, but appeals nonetheless. You know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. There's none of that training. That might exist for other members of the family. That was not something that was offered to me. So nobody tells you anything? No. Nobody prepares you? No, no I mean, no, but even down, yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem. No yeah. one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling, how, what's the national, I've got to learn this. I don't want to embarrass them. I need to learn these 30 mm -hmm. hymns for a church. All of this is televised. We were doing the training behind the scenes because I just wanted to make them proud. We noticed the extreme entitlement as she complains about minuscule challenges. I mean, that was not something that was offered to me. No one thought to say... With this kind of behavior, Megan doesn't need the press to damage her image. I do not and have never looked for sympathy in this, Harry says. By all definitions of the word sympathy, every single thing he and Megan's done in the past two years from documentaries to podcasts, has been to look for sympathy. Unlike William and Catherine, who, strangely enough, believe that private matters should remain in private. 